So now that we kind of know a little bit about networks, let's play with SSH. SSH is the secure shell. Uh, it's basically just logs you in to another server, okay? Uh, and it gives you a command line just like you have here. It's incredibly useful. You can send files through it. You can log into other servers through it. You can run commands on other servers. Um, I, if you have a desktop at home that you want to get into from the outside, you're going to file off of and you're going to SSH into it. Really, really useful. Okay. So the most um, basic thing you can do with SSH is connect into another server. The syntax for that is the command SSH. And then the username on the remote server, um, we have you guys set up. It's your first name, all lowercase. Bin, yours is your first name and your last name because Bin is a user on the computer already. Okay, and if the you know we use the roster, so if you're if there was two names for your first name, it's just the first one. So let's give this a try. So mine's Matt two at condor.andysailor.com, and then your password is the same as your username, and then you should see a screen like that. Same as your username. It's waiting for your password. So uh, when it gives you a link, yeah. When it when it asks you for your password, um, it's not going to give you any feedback, like stars or anything like that. So if you lose track of where you are, just hit enter and start. Basically, the host is going to establish. Exactly. Oh, sorry. Just so just Y. Hit Y and enter. Or yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah, it's going to ask you. you Please try yes. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> I, um, you can clear it. What's the question? Yes, I have. Sorry about that. Oh, so, it's also first name. Password is the first name. The full name? First name. So when you see, are you sure you want to continue connecting? Just type yes. And you won't see that again. Why, why did you get the problem of uh, entering yes or no? Okay, um, it's basically like a reverse authentication. Mm -hmm. You tell the server who you are, and the server tells you who it is. And, uh, do you want to still continue knowing that I am Yeah, they, you save a little chunk of information about that server locally. Okay, so and the next time we try to connect, it doesn't ask for the same thing. It so won't ask again. If that chunk of information changes, you so, yeah. might um, think that the server is compromised, so that server is not the same server you logged into last time. And if you're logging into like this really secure server, and that chunk of information changes, it'll say um, something like verification failed, and you know that I don't want to log into that because there might be um, some other server that someone else redirected my traffic to. So what if I'm connecting to the same server? So can the chunk of information change even though the server is not being compromised? It should not change. It'll change if you log into yourself, maybe, um, and then you log into yourself on another computer. But uh, we'll go to that. Is anybody not logged into Andy's computer, Condor? Two uh, yeah. probably have to take yeah. it on our, uh, not like it. Um, I'm not, but I, just, I wanted to ask, most of us can't um, remote into our machines at home because we're getting credit IP address from our XP. Right? So yeah. Well, no, you're getting, you get a public IP address from right. XP, but the router, but, it's, but it's not, it's it's dynamic, right? right? So you, you need to either exactly. remember that IP address or get a domain for yourself, which is like a few bucks a year. Um, you can do things yeah. like going DNS, yeah. which uh -huh. will detect you. I mean, there are ways to get around it, but if you're going to be doing it a lot, you just have to ask people to static IP. Um, but there are ways to get around if you just have regular Comcast, you need to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. There are tricks. Okay. Let's see how I'm logging into the machine. Okay. 
We good? Yeah. Okay. So now that we're into Andy's computer, we can see that we're there. Well, first of all, we can see it in the, uh, the prompt. But also, for example, you can look at the host name and see that we're on Condor. And now we want to get out. How do we get out? Um, you can type exit, which is just like when you exit the command line normally. And it'll take you back to where you were. OK? Also, a nice shortcut is um, <coughs> Control-D will drop you out. And then usually the prompt has the host name, so you don't forget where you are. Uh, I've done that before. I deleted files that I didn't want to delete. So. OK. Um, so we just authenticated using passwords to get into SSH or to get the SSH into the server. You can also use a public-private key pair to authenticate. It's a lot more convenient because you don't actually have to type anything in when you authenticate, and it's also a lot more secure. It's like best of both worlds. So to generate, how, so how is it secure if you know can do it without a password? Because it's a much bigger password, and the private portions of the password don't get exchanged over over the internet. So, like when I type in my password, the password actually gets sent to the remote server. Uh, Public-private keys, which you know, add a scope with what we're doing, um, is a way of um, sending secure information without actually exchanging the secret key of the information. So, so that's the Amazon Web Service. They they have a, a key. Those are SSH LP keys. And file. Like yeah. LP and file. Yeah. Those are those are SSH keys. All the authentication on Amazon EC2 is, is based off of SSH. All the keys are named with, uh, and their name ends with .pm. PM, yeah. And we're going to generate a file right now, just kind of almost exactly like that. So to, to generate your key file, um, the command is ssh-keygen. And it can take all the command line options to um, generate it in one go, but it's also interactive. Um, first, it asks you where you want to save it. This file is the default place to store it. Great place to store it. You don't need to change it. Um, and then you can enter a local password for your key file in case it gets compromised, like someone gets a hold of it. Um, I recommend you do that too. I'm just going to do PW. It asks me to enter it again, PW. And then there we go. I have a, a public private key pair stored on my computer which will allow me to authenticate to other um, to other hosts securely without having to type a password. Very convenient and very secure. Um, so one thing you need to do is get your private key, or excuse me, get your public portion of the key onto uh, the server that you want to log into. Uh, and there's a nice little convenient command to do that. It's called SSH copy ID. And we can copy that over to Andy's computer. This is, did you test this? Yeah. This is going to work. I didn't know I had it turned on. What? I didn't know I had key based off. It's default. This is more secure. Why did you turn it on? OK. So um, and then the argument is just like when you SSH. So your username on his computer at um, Does that matter that saving the files? I think your uh, yeah, password did not go through because it's too yeah. short. Uh, I think your that? password is too short. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I put it in. Yeah. Yeah. Password. That's fine, because it'll let you have a blank password, but it won't let you have a short password. <laughs> Okay, now that we all have nice, long, secure passwords for these keys, we can copy ID them onto Andy's computer. And then this, hopefully, will be the last time you actually have to type the password. And then, if it's successful, it'll print out something kind of like this. I think your password has to be at least five characters. Yeah, it'll just overwrite the other file. The other file will go back.
Do you spell it? Yeah, so one more. Uh, one more. Yeah. Problems, questions. Uh, what does this mean? Yes. So now you're That's fine. After you run copy ID, you're still on your ship. Make sure you didn't screw up. Okay. You should build up on this and type in your password. So what's the password? Okay, well, so you will need to type your password. No, this is the password you just created. Oh, I would. Okay. Right, so which possible do you have to use? Uh, which possible do you use? No, the, this is your oh, username. Oh, when you yeah. do yeah. copy so the, the one you used when you logged into it a minute ago. Yeah. Alright. So it's your first name. Yeah. Can you put a password? When I type the password, it says now try logging into the machine with SSH. Yeah, so it's successful. Yes, and it's a lot more secure than typing the password. So, by doing this, you send the file public key. I'm going to go over with Matt, the do files. you know what it means when you get a new identities found error when you run SSH copy ID? It's, I think it's because the key doesn't exist. No, because SSH key gen failed. You probably just have to do too short a password. And it looks like SSH mm -hmm. key gen mm -hmm. or. Does he have it? Yeah, it's the same thing. Did you log into Instagram? Yeah. Oh yeah, I have to re log I have to re log into his. If you exited it. Well, I already exited it though. So yeah. did you so did you do copy ID as I would have access to it? Uh, I'm having the same problem. I did. Okay. Just SSH just copy ID too. And then your first name at, 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 at Condor dot And then it asks for your password? Yep. And I put in the password I had done before. That's it. Yes. Can you try to log in like you did before? Where do you want to put in our first mm -hmm. password? So our first password. Your, your password is your first name. It's the same as your username. Yeah. So there could be some confusion as to which password they should be using yeah. now. So first the password is still the same on Andy's computer. Um, the password that you uh, entered into SSH keygen is just to protect that file. So 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 that password is still the same as the one yeah. and in fact, the one I put on mine. Does what that protects? That protects okay. the p private portion of what we just generated. I'm going to show you the files in a second. Okay. Um, but those files get read automatically into this utility, um, so you won't actually ever have to use that password again. Got it. Okay. I won't ever have to use the one that I showed in Andy's computer. No, it's just Okay. Um, so. Are they good? Uh, yeah, did you, first, did you get a password prompt the first time you log in? Yeah, when you copy ID, it's the last time you have to. Are you logged log into Condor? I'm not. No, so we should all be on our um, well, local machines now. A lot of people okay. like that. So let's, uh, let's talk about kind of what happened when we generated the IDs. You can see in the SSH directory on your on the VM, you have a few files now. Um, one of them is ID underscore RSA. This is the private portion of your new key pair. This is a secret. This doesn't go anywhere. It's yours. This is what's password protected by the password you entered into keygen. Okay? And then pub is the corresponding part, of, is the public portion of your key pair. Okay? Um, the that pub file gets put onto all the servers that you can log into. So if that server has your pub file, you can use your private file to authenticate. Okay? There was a picture or some little ASCII thing that showed up on the it's, it's a fingerprint. Okay. It's, it's, it's just a way so that, because these key pairs that you're generating are like, I think by default, uh, I don't know how or 512 or 1024. It, it's a lot of information. Yeah. Um, and then, so they just have like fingerprint visual cues as a way to kind of verify the key. So you could, let's say, look at the server and see what it's sort of fingerprint. Yeah, if you don't recognize it, you know that you didn't log in where you think you're logged in. Okay, all right. Okay, cool. So, it's because So is everybody on the VM now, not on Andy's computer? Yeah. So the, the file it says to check, it's not there. Which to check? I have the authorized keys. Okay, so that authorized keys is a list 
of these pub files uh, of private key, of the corresponding private key that you're going to allow to log in to you. Okay? So right now, I can't log into the VM. Oh, so you would check that on So the what you could do is SSH, copy ID, localhost. You want to verify it? Yes. Type your local VM password, which is user. And now we see that we haven't authorized keys on our own machine. So we can use our own private key pair to log in as, our, as ourselves. On Andy's computer, there's this authorized keys now. Okay. So if you were looking on the server, that would already be there. So idrsa.pub is a single private key. Authorized keys is a list. It's a whole bunch of private keys that you're going to use. Uh, you know, they're, they're people that you're allowing to log in as your username on this computer. Also, let's say GitHub uses private, uh, public private key pairs and, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of version control systems. So it's used a lot and it's starting to be used more and more because it is secure and convenient. Can't really that. Uh, question. Yeah. When we type the lsal SSH command, we yeah. should be in our network, right? On our uh, on, our, on your so VM, you should now have these four files. So I need to pre press exit to get out of control. Yeah. So but when I do that, I don't get the authorized authorized keys. Because um, so I was we were talking a second ago. I ran, I copied my ID to my own computer okay. just now. So oh. if you could try to run this, oh. copy ID localhost. Oh, and we should run that command at the at your own machine. Sure. You probably want to be able to log in to yourself. As we should. He has two hacks. It says there's an error because there were no identities found. What does it say? No identity found. Um, are you still on Andy's? No, I, I'm going to Yes. The procedure which we did, should we have done that on our PC? Everything from start to end or only the... Yeah. You did on Andy's computer? So just come back into the VM, run SSH eGen again. I can just show all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk around. Yeah. Okay. So, so it says in this one. So because I did the key gen from this one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, know. Um, I did the key gen from my version of the It's still. So you should be able to do SSH copy ID. Okay. 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 Yeah, so do SSH dash copy ID. Yeah, so you do SSH dash copy ID. You are not actually in the right now. You are in the right now. There's no ID. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
So this is the password that you that I just added a few minutes okay. ago. So yeah, if, if you go to login now and you get a, a pop-up window, a GUI window that asks you for your password, that's the password you typed into SSH Keygen. That hopefully is the last time you have to type that password. There is a program on the computer called GNOME Keyring that's going to remember that for you from now on, and you should be good to go. Okay. So, was everybody able to log into Andy's computer? I could log in, but I did not get a pop up to do the password. But did it ask you for any password? No. Then you're good. Yeah, it's because you already gave you password. It says system restart required. Right. What? But I just like, did the user thing? It says system restart required, and then now I'm back. So, so system restart. Yeah. Yeah. But, but then now, it just come back. Right, it, it won't be until so you just said for a few seconds. But then now, it's so, right here. And you only, uh, so can everybody get onto the command prompt on the VM now? Get out of Andy's computer? Yeah, you should be Okay. So, um, I don't know about you, but I kind of find typing all this cumbersome every single time. So SSH has a config file so that you can define all these things and you don't have to type them again. Okay? Um, so I'm going to use a GUI editor so that we don't drop it to the BI. Um, so type, you can type gedit.ssh slash config. So we're just going to also copy it to my server. And now so you've opened up your SSH config file. You still have this code. All right, so what was the. So this is your password. Right. Okay. Edit. Now I'm going to go to SSH and my server. You should ask you for my password. Okay, so this is the password that you did a minute ago, but this is the only time you should have it. Right, it's this. You guys have it open. Now you should be good. So now you can exit. Now you don't need to type in the password. Okay. So let's let's create a shortcut. It says run. But G edit help to see if it was available. Come on. But doesn't open. Type it just like I said. Yes. G edit. In your home directory. G edit. Yes. In your home directory. G edit. Dot ssh. Slash. Are you still using machine? Are you on any machine? No. G edit should be on. Because you can do this when you should also be able to do it. This may not actually work for some reason. It's kind of a little bit of a change. You were SSH'd into your phone. You were logged into yourself. All right, so does everybody have the SSH config file? Open in GS. So now we're going to create a shortcut so that we don't have to type usernames and passwords. The shortcut's going to look like this. Host name, we'll call it Andy. Host condor. User is your username on Andy's computer. Okay, so just type it exactly like that. Except for the mat, too. You can make the host name right? Yeah. This part is your keyword, and then you're going to set a whole bunch of settings that you want to refer to that keyword. And then we can just point and click save. Oh. Could have gone through that. So once we have this file saved, we can close gedit, ssh andy. <laughs> Maybe I did it backwards. I think it's host, and then this is host name. Sorry. That's probably right. Okay. I did it backwards, I apologize. It's host andy, host name is the actual IP address or domain name. And then once you have this file saved, 
you should be able to just say SSH Andy, and you're logged into Andy. You don't have to type your username, you don't have to type the host name, and all the commands that use SSH internally, you can just use Andy to refer to them. So I'm getting uh, could not resolve host name. I guess I'm doing it. So I, I, I had a type out. Yeah, so you need to be, it's, that he's, it's host there, it is host name there. Yeah, so okay. capital name, not the name space. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Good. Everybody you must got their handy the keyword now. I don't remember. Yeah, so we'll actually. Okay. So one of the really useful things that SSH can do for you is forward ports. Um, and this is useful if, for example, you have a home router and you want to get into it, but you don't want to leave um, port 80 open. So you don't want to leave the interface, web interface open to the world just on the inside of your network, which is usually the default config for these things. So what you can do is SSH into a host on your network and forward a port over so that you can get into this router. Um, so let's see how we do that. Let's call a local port forward. The syntax is like this, it's dash capital L, and then some port on your computer that you want to be forwarded to the remote computer. I always do something like 5555. And then it's going to be the address that you want to access. Okay, so what we're going to do is forward localhost colon 5555 to Andy's web server. Okay? And then once you do that, you're, you've logged in and you just kind of let that hang out in the background. So, any any problems running this? Logging into Andy. Okay, and then you can open up Firefox. Uh, hopefully this works. And go to localhost five 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 or whatever you chose, and we'll see that we we're on Andy's web page, but we're accessing it from our own computer over an encrypted SSH connection. So, I'll, I'll do it all again. So, starting locally, SSH capital L. You choose the IP address. I like 5555. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, the port. The port, I'm sorry. IP port. Um, and then localhost 80 is going to refer to Andy's web. So, this localhost is localhost on Andy's server, not your own. Okay. Let me log into Andy. Open up Firefox. Uh, you know that website isn't hosted there. Right? Well, but it gets redirected. Right. Right. It should redirect. Okay. So you should at least see this in Firefox. Well, I might. So, could you just explain what localhost okay, oh, port 80 on Andy's machine is? Um, so, localhost is a special host name that always refers to yourself. Okay? 80 is a port that web servers listen to, um, listen on by default. So, SSH uses port 20, web servers use port 80. It basically divides. So, it's connecting to the web server on Andy's machine? Yes. This is going to be so good for my Google Analytics. Good. Do you get money? Okay. And again, the reason why you would want to do this is if you were trying to get to a host uh, behind a firewall or you know on a remote network, but you can SSH into at least one computer on that network, you can do a port forward to get yourself other services on that network. Okay. Um, there's also a reverse port forward. So if how do you close the existing port? So just as soon as you log out, the port forward's gone. Okay. So if you get yourself back onto the command line of the VM now, off of Andy's computer. Okay, so this didn't actually complete. We can do a, a reverse port forward. Okay. 
And what this says is forward port 5555 on Andy's computer to port 80 on our own computer, okay? Um, okay. So it's just like the logo, but reverse. So we, do okay. we don't actually have to run this because it's not, there's nothing visual on our, on our VMs. So it's going to help us be mm -hmm. So that's why I what I was doing. Everybody cool with understand the general concept behind port forward? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's you don't understand it? What, why do you want to port forward? It, it creates a tunnel on so one so port. So it basically like keeps everything encrypted as you're transferring what files? Encrypt? Yeah. No, not necessarily files, but um, certainly. Usually you'll do it for like web pages. Yeah. Like you have some internal web page on your home network, like your routers config, mm -hmm. right? And you don't want to leave the public side open, like usually right. the router configs have, you know, uh, yeah, you listen on the public network, listen locally. Um, so you don't have to leave the public part open. You can port forward into your own network and then get on to the router. Got it. Okay? So that command port was, was used, can they be like, what is yeah. the it's like So this 555 one is yeah. your choice. Yeah. But no, what's the limit for port Well, uh, two to the, the 16 is one. So that's like 65,000. Yeah. Um, okay. There's a third type of port forwarding called dynamic port forwarding. This is not good if you're um, at work and they have a firewall or a web proxy and they don't let you get to Facebook or whatever you want to look at. You can port forward into your house and route all your internet traffic to your home encrypted to your computer so they can't see what you're doing at work. Okay? <laughs> to do that, it's dash capital D, and then one port, 5555, five, 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 go to, Andy. So now we have a dynamic port forward from our computer to Andy's computer. You can go into your web browser, and you can go to the the network proxy settings. So it's in the advanced tab, network settings. Everybody see that? And you can create a, a SOX proxy to localhost 55555. OK. And now we see that all of our traffic is going through Andy's computer. We can go to a cool web site called ifconfig.me, and we see our host name is comcastbusiness.net, which is not what the, con what the campus network uses. Okay. Um, if you want, you can undo the proxy settings, close your SSH connection, and then go back to that web page, and you'll see that you're on the campus network settings, so just go to um, I think auto detect is the default. Hey Matt, what's the SSH config file where you made Andy? Is it just dot SS? Dot SSH slash config. Okay. So we close our port forward, go back to ifconfig.me, and now we see that we're at Colorado Okay? Do you that on the Okay. Copy the Right. From scratch now, the dynamic port card. Great if you're at work, right? <laughs> From your VM, SSH dash capital D, and then pick a port, usually something high like you know 5555, handy. Enter. So now we are logged into Andy's computer, but we also have this port forward thing going on in the background. Okay. Open up your browser, hopefully you know, Firefox or Google Chrome. Um, go to the network proxy settings, uh, advanced network settings. Click the radio button for manual proxy settings. The SOX host is localhost. The port is the one you chose with dash D, 5555. And it's SOX V5, I think, usually. Click OK. Close the preferences, and then we go to ifconfig.me, and we can see our host name is Andy's public IP address, not 
your Colorado IP address. Yes. So Colorado can't tell that we're at ifconfig.me right now. All the traffic was encrypted from Andy's computer to our own VMs, and then displays. Okay? ifconfig.me is just a handy little website for kind of getting information about yourself. Kind of see, how, it's like a mirror, see how the world's on you. What's the port number? 555. Five, five. Oh, the port number. Yeah, it's proxy. In the, 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 so, what's the difference between SSH dash L and dash T? Because I did it with So, L is a local port forward. It sent one port from your computer to some other host that may be seen by the remote host. This reverse port forward takes one port on the remote host and forwards it to some port that you can see, or some host that you can see on your computer. And then D dynamically forwards all traffic from your computer to the other computer. But D is like application specific, so you actually have to go into Firefox and enable it so that it can be used as a web proxy. And so now Andy's computer is our web proxy. So it's like a mini VPN just for web pages. So you said the Colorado network can't detect that we have visited this site because yes. we are routing it through Andy's computer. Yeah. But they can see that Andy is using the same. They, no, all they can see is that we're sending encrypted traffic to Andy's computer. They don't know what that traffic is. They don't know who it's going to once it leaves Andy's computer. Or, or. This doesn't mean you should all be doing your file sharing through my server for the next two weeks, though. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we'll, we'll turn this off, but um, it's, yeah, I, it's, it's good at work. It, they're blocking something that you don't think that should be. Blocked. It's also good when you're traveling in Europe and you want to watch Netflix, which is automatically blocked in Europe. Of silly licensing rules, so you can just re tunnel through a server in the United States, and then all of a sudden Netflix and Hulu and all of that jazz will work. Yeah. Hello. Any more questions about this? We're just, a, we're just a product. Um, in Firefox, you go to you get the preferences. It's an advanced network and then the connection settings. And then don't forget, like when you get home or you're done with that connection, to just turn it off. Otherwise, no web page will work for you. install SSH on your Ubuntu server, it'll install SSH for you and I think automatically start the server so you don't have to worry about it. So you just have that computer at home and just install that SSH. Yeah, install OpenSSH and um, in your home network router, you want to forward port 22 to the computer that's using, that is the SSH server. Okay? And then you have your dynamic proxy, or coverage and tool, um, everything, okay? All right, final thing that we're gonna do with SSH is there's kind of this express mode, so if you get back onto the VM command line, um, you can do SSH, the remote host, and then a command like cat, Etsy, hostname, and it'll automatically log into Andy, run that command, and, and exit. So it's, it's nice if you just want to run one command on a remote computer. And you can see that we printed out Condor and not uh, the, the VPN. It's working. Uh, the VM. Yeah. Okay? Um, it, this won't work for commands like LL, which is uh, alias for another command. So it'll only work for real commands. Um, we'll go into the difference between those when we do shells and shells. Okay? So, um, 
One last thing is, um, sometimes you run a command that needs user input. So like, let's say you wanted to SSH into Andy and run sudo cat hosting. Uh, it's going to get all kind of messed up because uh, it, when you run a command, it doesn't set itself up to get input from you. So there's this dash T option if you're ever having problems, which forces um, back and forth input. Um, and at that point, it'll ask you for your, your password on any computer, which you don't have. So, or you don't have pseudo access on this computer. Okay? So if you're ever running a command remotely and it's not working right, just try adding that dash T. Okay? And now we're going to go over, Andy's going to go over some commands. A lot of these use SSH internally to do all their magic. So you get out of the box um, the security and convenience of SSH. Okay?